Hello, everyone. Welcome to Physics 205. In this lecture, we're going to talk about the actual causes of the motion, which is called dynamics or sometimes called uh, kinetics, especially in biomechanics, they use the term kinetics. So previously, we talked a lot about um, the motion of different objects, like kinematics. Now we're going to actually introduce what is causing the motion. So these are the forces um, and then later the torques that cause the motion. So let me start um, by giving you some definitions. So a really simple definition of a force is you can think of it as simply a push or pull on an object. So there's some contact, you're either pushing or pulling, or it could be um, a force that acts at a distance as well, okay? So in general, forces are classified as either contact forces or field, which is like a long range or long distance force. Contact forces involve direct contact between two objects. Um, some examples would include, say, the tension force in a string, right? If a string is connected to an object, there's going to be a force. If you're pulling on a string, it's called the tension force in the string. So that force will act on the object. Um, if you're just simply pushing an object, then the contact force would be the force that your hand exerts on the object, right, while, while you're attempting to push it. Um, a normal force that comes up is the contact force that a surface exerts on the object, and it's always perpendicular to the surface, okay? So that's a normal force. Um, another contact force that often uh, comes up, and we'll see it a bunch in this class, is a frictional force. So frictional force, again, is the force that the surface exerts on the object, but now it's going to be parallel to the surface, Okay, and it sort of resists the motion of the object. So those are all contact forces, right? Where there's actual contact between the two objects that are involved. It could be the surface and the object, it could be two objects. The other type of forces um, that we're gonna see are called field forces or like long range forces. So field forces influence objects at a distance. And some examples include the gravitational force, and that gravitational force actually has a name that we use often. We call it the weight of the object. Okay, some people say the force due to gravity, right, which is really the weight due to the object. Um, another field force is the electric force. In this class, however, we're going to focus almost exclusively on the gravitational force. Okay, so when we talk about like long distance forces, really the only one that comes up in this course is going to be the gravitational force. Okay, so how are we gonna solve these types of problems, these applications where we have forces and we wanna determine the motions of particular objects? Well, we're gonna use um, three laws that Newton derived or came up with uh, hundreds of years ago. So let me, let me describe each of these laws. So Newton's first law says that an object moves with a velocity that is constant in magnitude and direction unless acted upon by a non-zero net external force. So at first this may seem counterintuitive, right? Because if you take say, you know, an eraser and you throw it on a desk, it'll slide for a little bit, but then it comes to a rest. Why does it come to a rest? Because really there's a force acting in that eraser. Uh, eraser. That force is the force of friction, okay? However, if you take an object, let's say you're in space away from all other planets, so there's no, uh, a very small gravitational for force acting on the object, and it has, you give it some initial velocity and some initial direction, that object will continue moving in that same direction with that same velocity forever, okay? And until, unless it's acted on by um, another large force. So in general, the natural state of things is for an object to move with constant velocity motion, unless acted upon by a force. And actually we'll see this in lab when we um, when we use the air track, which reduces friction. And at least we'll see this one dimensionally where an object appears to move at a constant velocity. Okay, another definition is something called inertia. And inertia is simply like the tendency of an object to continue in its original state of motion. And a measure of an object's inertia is called the mass of the object, okay? You can also think of mass as sort of offering resistance to changes in motion by applied forces. And we'll see that when we look at the equation that involves forces and acceleration, mass is gonna appear in that equation. 
So mass is simply like the resistance to changes in motion, right, to accelerations. All right, Newton's second law. And this is probably going to be the most important one, at least when we're talking about um, applied problems and solving equations of motion. So Newton's second law says the acceleration of an object is directly proportional to the net force acting on it and inversely proportional to its mass. So in equation form, you can write that as the acceleration is equal to the net force, which remember, this is a vector, right? So the net force is the sum of all the forces. So another way of writing that is just sum, this big E here, this sigma here means sum. We're summing all the vector forces, right? That gives us the net force and then divided by mass. That is equal to the acceleration. However, usually we think of the force as the cause of the acceleration, right? The cause of the motion producing the acceleration. So typically we write, we rearrange this equation and we write it like this. We write it as a net force, which is the same as the sum of the forces is equal to MA. And you may have heard of this before, right? You've heard of F equals MA. That F really means the net force, right? Or the sum of the forces. Now, this is a vector equation, right? So it's kind of like, efficient notation for several equations in one being a vector equation. If you introduce a, what's called an inertial coordinate system, like an XY coordinate system that we can measure everything relative to, then this equation can be broken up or split up into its components, into its X, Y, and if you have three dimensions, a Z component as well, but typically in this class, we'll be dealing with like two dimensional motion. So this equation can be broken up into these two scalar equations, which are no longer vectors. They're just, they're just true along these particular motions. So <clears throat> we can say that the sum of the forces, if we're talking about just the x direction, is equal to the mass times the acceleration in the x direction. And then the sum of the forces in the y direction, if we have all the forces in the y direction, that's going to equal to the mass times the acceleration of the y direction. So this is just F equals MA again, but for the particular components, right? The X and Y components. So this one vector equation is just shorthand for these two scalar equations. Okay, and then Newton's third law, which is also really important. It says if object one, in object two, let's say you have two objects, they interact. The force, which we call F12, it's a vector again. And this notation means the force exerted by object one on object two is equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction of the force F21. And this means the force exerted by object two on object one. So if two objects are interacting, right? There's a force on one of the objects due to the other object, and there's an equal and opposite force on the original object. So a, a way of writing that in vector form is this. We could say that the force um, by object one acting in object two is equal to negative the force by object two acting on object one. So this takes into account the fact that their directions are opposite, but their magnitudes are the same. So if you want to write this in terms of magnitudes, you, you don't use the vectors. You could just say F12 equals F21, right? The magnitudes are equal. But when you write it in vector form, you have to put a negative here because the directions are opposite, okay? And we'll talk more about this um, when, when we start looking at some examples. Okay, um, the weight of an object is simply the gravitational force at the surface of the earth or near the surface of the earth acting on the object. And to calculate the weight of the object, it's simply equal to the mass of the object, right, in kilograms, times the acceleration due to gravity, which is a vector. So this G here, right, this vector G is acceleration due to gravity. It points towards the center of the earth and its magnitude is 9.8 meters per second squared. So that's the value of G. That's the magnitude of G. Where does this come from? This comes from Newton's like gravitational law. Um, actually, let me jump on the iPad and let me explain this because we're going to use this quite often. The weight is almost always going to be a force acting on um, a particular object. If it has mass and it's near the surface of the earth, there's going to be a weight involved. So let, let me explain this more carefully here.
Okay, so again, let's look at the gravitational force um, between two objects. What is that gravitational force between two objects? So these two objects could be actually could be anything. It could be one student and another student. It could be um, the Earth and a student. It could be the Earth and the Moon. Okay, um, I drew these as circles. So let let's think of this first object as being like say the Earth and then the Moon. The M two is the Moon here. So Newton derive the fact that the force, say, in this case, um, I'll say the force due to the Earth, so F1 comma 2, acting on the moon. So remember, this is the 1 here means the, the object causing the force, and the 2 is the force that the object is acting on, is equal to, according to Newton, it's going to be some constant g the product of the masses, so m1 times m2, divided by the distance between the objects squared. Okay, so that's the gravitational force between two objects. It just depends on each mass. So it's a product of the masses and it's inversely proportional to the distance between the objects squared. And when you have planets like this, right, or some large, large objects, um, the distance is defined to be the distance from the center of the two objects. It's really the center of mass, but we can think of it as this, if it's the Earth and the Moon, it'd be the center of those two objects here. So R would be that distance. So you can sort of see here, if the masses are larger, the force is going to be larger. If the distance between them is larger, then that's going to make the force smaller, right? So it depends on the masses and depends on that distance. And then this is just a constant G, which I'll give to you in a, in a few minutes. Okay, but the only situation that we're really interested in is the weight of an object, which is the gravitational force acting on an object when it's near the surface of the Earth, right? So I'm going to draw this out. Let's say let's say this is the Earth, okay, and it has um, so this is the Earth. And it has some mass, I'll call it Me. Right, so Me is the mass, huge mass, right, of the Earth. And we want to know the gravitational force acting on some object M, which is really, really close. It's even hard to draw this, right? Because you would be you wouldn't be able to see it in a picture if it was really, really close, but I'll just draw it like that. So that's M. And the distance that that object is away from the center of the Earth is really just the radius of the Earth, right? Because it's right on the surface. So this is just the radius of the Earth. Okay, so, so if we call this, let's say the Earth is object one, and then this little mass here is object two. So the force by the Earth acting on object two, which we also call the gravitational force, I'll just use a sub G for gravitational force, that's got to be equal to um, G, the mass of the Earth, times the mass of that little object, divided by the radius. But in this case, the radius is simply the radius of the Earth squared. OK, well, we can look up these values. It turns out the radius of the Earth is around 6371000 meters, right? So around 6.3, I guess, million meters. The mass of the Earth, huge mass, is 5.97219 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. And then this constant G here is 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11. And it has units Newton times meters squared divided by kilogram squared. Okay, now what we wanna compute, and we'll see that why in a second, we want to compute just this set of variables right here. We're going to leave that. We're going to leave the mass of the object, the little m, out of it for now. So if I compute that 
what that value is. So this is going to be G M E over the radius of the earth squared. So if I plug in these values, right, this is going to be 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11 times the mass of the earth, which is 5.97219. I'll just round it to two times 10 to the 24 divided by 6.371 times 10 to the 6, but that's squared. It turns out you're going to get 9.8. 9.81, depending on where you are on the Earth, but it's around 9.8 meters per second squared. And notice that this is the value for that constant G, right? We said G is the acceleration of an object near the surface of the earth, okay? So it turns out that the gravitational force, which is simply the weight of the object is equal to the mass of the object times, right over here we have it times GME over RE squared, right? It's the mass of the object times this quantity. But this quantity is just what we're calling little g. Okay, so that's why we always say the weight of the earth is, or the weight of the object is simply equal to mg, right? It's the mass of the object um, times the acceleration due to gravity near the surface of the earth. The these are really vectors, so. This is really a vector. And wh where does it point? Well, it's going to point towards, because the gravitational force is always attractive, it's going to point towards the center of the Earth. So the weight points down towards the center of the Earth. But in terms of the magnitude, it's simply equal to mg, right? So the weight is equal to mg. And we'll use that a lot throughout this class. Okay, let's look at a simple example and see if we can indicate all the forces acting on different objects that are in this example. So you're told in this case, a book sits on a table. So actually, let me draw this out here. So I have, I have a table. Right, it's sitting on the floor. And then I have a book. sitting on the table. Okay, and the first question is, what are all the forces acting on the book? So what we'd like to do is to isolate that book um, by itself. So I'm gonna draw it separately. So here's the book. And I wanna draw all the forces acting on the book. So this is what's called a free body diagram. If you draw all the forces acting on the object, so the first force that we can draw is the force that the earth exerts on the book, which is the gravitational force, right? Which acts down towards the center of the earth. And we know it's equal to the, it's really what we're calling the weight of the book, right? So I'll say, um, I'll call it F sub G, which is gravitational force, but that's really what we're calling the weight of the book. And that's equal to MG that acts down. Okay, so the weight of the book you know, I'll write it out here what I'm, so the first force is the weight of the book, which is the gravitational force um, that the earth exerts on the book. Okay, what are some other forces acting on the book? Well, notice that the book is sitting on the table, right? So the table 
must be pushing up on the book. And that's what we call a normal force. So this, I'll draw it like this. I'll call it N. I'll use these like a sub T, meaning the table. So the normal force which we're calling N sub T. Um, this is the force that the table exerts upward on the book. Now with normal forces, normal forces are always perpendicular to the surface. So in this case, this force is perpendicular to the table, right? It's pushing up perpendicular to the table. Um, so I'll say the normal force is perpendicular to the surface. Remember, perpendicular means it, it's like at a right angle, right? At a right angle, acts at a right angle to the surface. Okay, and then that's it, right? There are no other, we're, we're ignoring any other um, like buoyancy of the air and that, I mean, there could be very, very small other sources, no like, um, you know, wind blowing on the book or anything. So if we're just focusing on the situation where it's sitting on the table, then there's two forces acting on the book. We have gravitational force, right? The weight of the book, and then the normal force, the force that the table exerts on the book. Okay, what about the forces on the table? Okay, so now let me draw. So now we're gonna look at the table. I'm gonna draw the table by itself. Okay, well, the earth is exerting a force on the table, right? There's a gravitational force of the earth exerting a table. So what is that? That's like the weight of the table. That would be like at the center of mass. I don't know where that, say like right here, let's say. So I'll just draw that downward. So I'll say W. So we have the weight of the table. So that's one force acting on the table. Now the floor is pushing up on the table. Actually it's doing it in two places. I'll write like this. So this is like N floor. So there's a normal force, right? That the floor exerts on the table. And then also, remember that book was sitting on the table. So there was a force that the table exerted on the book, which we found here, right? That was the normal force that the table exerted on the book. But here's where Newton's third law comes in. Because of Newton's third law, it says there must be an equal and opposite force that the book exerts on the table, which is going to be, in this case, it'll be downward. I'll just draw it like this arrow going downward. So I'll call this NT prime, right? It's it's gonna have the same magnitude as the normal force that we calculated over here that the table exerts on the book, but it's in the opposite direction, right? Same magnitude, opposite direction. So I'll write this as, um, it's the normal force that the book exerts on the table. Okay, and again, that has to be there because of Newton's third law, okay?
uh, actually here, I'll write that out for you. So due to Newton's third law, Um, nt, so the normal force that the table exerts on the book, and nt prime, the normal force that the book exerts on the table, are equal and opposite. So they have the same magnitude, but they're in opposite directions. And notice here, too, this is important, they also act on different objects. Right, and that will always be the case when you have a pair of Newton third law forces. They act on different objects, right? The force that the table exerts on the book only acts on the book. And the force that the book exerts on the table only acts on the table, okay? Now, you might say, okay, um, remember in the uh, on the book example, we said, all right, there's a force that the earth exerts on the book. Right, that's the weight of the book here, which is mg, the weight of the book. So due to Newton's third law, there must be an equal and opposite force. But what is that equal and opposite force? Well, that would be the force that the book exerts on the earth. Yes, the book actually exerts a force on the earth, but the earth is so large that the effects due to that force are negligible, okay? But that is actually the Newton's third law pair. Okay, so I'll write that down here. So you have a force. Remember, it's the weight of the book, right? So it's a force that the earth exerts on the book. You can think of it like this. I'll write it as force or EB, right? Earth on book. Well, there's also a force that the book exerts on the earth. And that force is FBE. And they have the same magnitude, but they have opposite directions. So if I wrote them as vectors, one of them would have to have a negative sign. Right, the force that the earth exerts on the book is downward. The force that the book exerts on the earth would be upward, right? The book would be pulling up on the earth. Okay, so that would be like the Newton's third law pair of forces for the weight, the weight of the book, which is the same thing as the force that the earth exerts on the book. Okay, this takes a little more practice, but eventually you'll get the hang of um, drawing all the forces that act just on the object that you're interested in. All right, next, let's talk about another force that's gonna come up quite often in this course. Um, it's a contact force called frictional force. So let me start by describing a situation. Let's say I have an object and I exert a force, say to the left, and the object is not moving. We're gonna assume it's not moving. Well, that means because it's not moving, it means that the sum of the forces, the net force must equal zero, right? There's no acceleration. So therefore there's gotta be a force that's resisting the motion that acts to the right. And it must have the same magnitude as the force that I'm exerting here, right? So the length of this vector is gonna be the same length here, but this force is resisting it. So it's in the opposite direction. This is what we call a static frictional force. So I'll write that as Fs. So this is a static frictional force. Now, if I pull harder, so same object here. Now let's say I exert an even larger force. And let's say the object is still not moving, 
Well, then that static frictional force must increase, right? To match the force that I'm pulling with. So the magnitudes are equal again, because the object is not moving, right? There's no acceleration. So this is also the static frictional force, but now it's increased to match the force that I'm pulling with. Now you can keep doing that, but at some point the object is the object is going to move. Let's say you keep doing that until the object is on the verge of motion. So now I pull even harder, so I have an even longer force here. And I'm gonna say the object is on the verge of motion. So it's just ready to start moving. So now the force that is gonna resist it is still a static frictional force, right? Cause it's not moving yet, but now it's the largest that that static frictional force can be. So we call this Fs max. So the largest that the static frictional force can be is Fs max. So notice here, usually you'll see a static frictional force defined to be an inequality. It's greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to Fs max. So what does that mean? It means if I'm not pulling at all, right? If I don't exert any force at all to the left here, there's not gonna be a, um, a static frictional force. No friction is gonna be resisting in motion because I'm not pulling with any force. So it could be zero. This frictional force could be zero. If I pull with a small amount, I have a small static frictional force. If I pull with a larger amount and it's still not moving, I have a larger static frictional force. If I pull with an even larger um, force here, and now the object say is on the verge of motion, but still not moving, then that's gonna be the maximum that that static frictional force can be. So that's what we call Fs max, okay? So the, the way to think about static friction uh, force is when the object is not moving. And it's always gonna match the force that you're pulling with up to this maximum here. Okay, so that's static frictional force. The other frictional force that we're gonna deal with um, is something called kinetic friction. That's when an object is moving. So now let's say we have an object and it has some velocity, let's say. Let's say I pull with some force and it has some um, velocity. So it's like moving, let's say to the left. There's still a force that's resisting the motion, right? But now since it's moving, that force that's resisting the motion is called a kinetic frictional force. So this is a kinetic frictional force. When, I'll say when object is moving. And it doesn't actually matter if the object is moving at a constant velocity or if it's accelerating, right? It's not gonna change. You're gonna have the kinetic frictional force and there'll be some particular value, okay? It won't vary. So it turns out actually, if it's moving at a constant velocity, that means there's no acceleration. And if you measure the force that you're pulling with, that's gonna be the same magnitude as a kinetic frictional force. However, you could exert an even larger force and it could accelerate to the left and that's not gonna change a kinetic frictional force. Now you're just gonna have a net force acting at the left and it'll accelerate to the left, okay? So just think of it in general as a kinetic frictional force is acting when the object is moving, right? It's a force that the surface exerts on the object resisting the object's motion. There will be a lot of times where we assume that the surface is frictionless and then we don't have any frictional forces, right? This is only gonna apply when we assume that we do have friction. Okay, well, how do we actually um, come up with a value for these forces? It turns out there's a simple model that we use. So for the static frictional force, It turns out that this model works fairly well. And you can say that the static frictional force, actually I should be careful, Fs max, the max static frictional force. 
is proportional to the normal force. And that proportionality constant we call mu s. So mu s times n. This is so this mu s here is called the coefficient. of static friction. And the N here is the normal force. This coefficient here, this is just a number. It represents something about the two surfaces that are moving relative to one another. It, it, it might be like 0.72 or 0.80 or 0.55, whatever it is, it's just some number. Okay. And then it depends on what the surfaces is, right? If you have, you know, an ice skate on ice, you're going to have a much smaller um, US. If you have um, a rubber shoe on asphalt, you're going to have a much larger US. So it depends on the surfaces that are sliding over one another. But then this frictional force, so it depends on that constant and also depends on the normal force. If you have a larger normal force, so typically if you have a larger weight, right, you're going to have a larger normal force, then that's going to increase this frictional force, okay? So that's the equation for Fs max. There's a similar equation for Fk, for the kinetic frictional force, except it has its own coefficient, which we call mu k. So it's mu k times n, and this mu k here is called the coefficient of kinetic friction. Now, typically, usually, um, Fs max is greater than Fk. Okay, so that max static frictional force is typically greater than Fk, than the kinetic frictional force. The way to think about this is think, think about moving like a large piece of furniture. It's harder to initiate the motion, right? Which is really overcoming this Fs max than it is to keep it moving at some velocity, which is which would then be the Fk. So Fs max is greater than Fk, right? It's harder to initiate the motion than it is to keep it moving. Because that's true, and because these forces are proportional to normal force, this means that that coefficient of static friction, mu s, is greater than the coefficient of kinetic friction, mu k. So typically mu s is greater than mu k. Okay, so fs max is greater than fk, which means mu s is greater than mu k. And we actually, we will explore this um, a lot more in lab. You could, um, if you want to see like a graph of this, let's say I plot frictional force in Newtons on the y-axis and in time on the x-axis. Say so time in seconds. And again, we will do this in lab. What you're gonna find, let's say you connect um, a string to like uh, a block that's sitting on a surface, right? And there's friction between the surface and the block and you pull on the string. At first, the object is not going to move but that frictional force, the force that you're pulling with, which is going to be the same as the frictional force, is going to increase. It'll reach a peak at some point. Then the object will start moving. And if you keep pulling it at a constant velocity, then this force will kind of plateau as long as you're pulling at a constant velocity. So here, let me break this up. So you can think of this as right before that peak, this is where the object is not moving. What you're pulling on it, so that force is increasing. And then after it reaches the peak, this is where the object is moving. Well, this peak value right here, so that peak force, that is Fs max. Right? That's the force that's resisting your motion right before the object starts to move. And then if you get past that, the object starts moving. And then the force now that you're recording, as long as you're pulling at a constant velocity, this is your Fk.
Okay, so again, generally Fs max is greater than Fk, right? See how that peak is always gonna be larger than the plateau region here, which is your kinetic frictional force. Okay, well, this will make more sense in lab when we demonstrate this. Actually, we'll do a lab on it. We're actually measuring these values. Okay, so now we know, um, now that we know a little bit about some forces and the different types of forces that might be acting on an object, we've learned about Newton's second law um, and Newton's first law and third law as well, so Newton's laws in general. Now we want to actually apply these laws to some problems, right? So we want to do some problem solving now, some applications. So there's a couple of things you should keep in mind when trying to solve um, problems involving Newton's laws. So the first thing, and we talked about this a little bit already, you want to start by isolating the, isolating the object of interest and drawing all the forces acting in, on the object. That's going to be really helpful. That's called a free body diagram. So you isolate the object and you draw all the forces acting on the object. Then what you want to do, because Newton's um, second law is only true if you have what's called an inertial reference frame, it's relative, motion is relative to, to some inertial reference frame. You want to indicate what that inertial reference frame is and then resolve the forces that you drew in the first um, free body diagram here in step one into their X and Y components. So resolve the forces into their X and Y components. So figure out like what direction you want X and Y to represent. That's That will be the inertial reference frame. And then resolve the forces into their actual X and Y components. Okay. You can think of an inertial reference form frame as like some reference frame that the motion is going to occur relative to. So like if we're talking about an object moving on your lab bench, then if you have a frame that's attached to the lab bench, that will be your inertial reference frame. Let's say the X direction is like along the bench and Y would be perpendicular to the bench. Okay. Um, don't worry about that too much. I'll show you that when we start working on some of these problems, like what I mean by an inertial reference frame. Once you have the free body diagram drawn and you resolved all the component, the forces into their X and Y components, then you want to actually apply Newton's second law. And I would use it in um, component form, right? So you're going to sum all the forces in the X direction. That's going to equal MAX. Sum all the forces in the Y direction. That's going to equal MAY. You want to include any other constraint equations. Usually in our case, these will be things like if an object is sitting on a table, then, or even if an object is on a table, but moving just horizontally to the table, then there's no Y motion. So the acceleration in the Y direction would be zero. That's what I mean by a constraint equation. We won't get much more complicated than that. Okay. Once you have those equations, then you can solve those equations. They're called the equations of motion for the unknown variables. Usually you're solving them for the acceleration or whatever is being asked for in this particular problem. And then last but not least, you should check to make sure your answer makes sense. Okay, are the units correct? Um, do the answer sound reasonable? Does the answer make sense? Okay, so for the rest of this lecture, what I wanna do now is actually solve a bunch of applied problems, right? So we get some experience with using Newton's second law. So let me go back to the iPad and we'll do that. Okay, so in this first example, you're told a 6.0 kilogram object undergoes an acceleration of 2.5 meters per second squared. What is the magnitude of the resultant force acting on the object? And then if the same force is applied to an object with a mass of 4.0 kilograms, what would be the acceleration? Okay, so let's let's draw a picture here. So here's my object. There's going to be some applied force, right? Some net force. I'm just gonna draw acting to the right. We'll assume that the object is undergoing an acceleration. We know it has to be in the same direction, right? This is really a vector. So the acceleration in this case is given as 2.5 meters per second squared. 
I'm just drawing that above with an arrow indicating the direction of the acceleration, right? It has to be the same direction as the net force, but be careful. Do not actually draw the acceleration attached to the object because it's not a force, right? The only thing you're drawing on the object are the forces acting on the object. So in this case, we just have a net force. We're calling it to the right, acting to the right. If you want, we can, we can create a little coordinate system here. I can say that the X direction is to the right and the Y direction is vertical. Okay, so that's my um, coordinate system. So now let me apply Newton's second law. And I really only need to use the X direction in this case, because I have no forces acting in the Y direction. So I'm gonna do Newton's second law in the X direction, which means the sum of the forces in the X direction must equal the mass of this object times the acceleration in the X direction. Okay, so the only force acting on the x in the x direction is this one force we're calling the net force. And that's got to equal the mass of the object times the acceleration in the x direction. Well, the acceleration in the x direction, we're already given here, right? It's 2.5 meters per second squared. Because I know that because it's acting in the x direction. So that means the net force here is simply going to be equal the mass, which is 6.0 times the acceleration, which is 2.5. And if you work that out, it's going to be 15 newtons. OK, now just to save space, I didn't write in the, um, the units when I'm working on a problem. Some people like to do that. You can if you want to. So you, in other words, you could have done this. You could have written this out. I'll do it more carefully here. F net equals 6.0 kilograms. And then the acceleration is 2.5 meters per second squared. And then when I multiply these, I get 15. And then I'm going to get kilograms times meters over second squared. But that combination of units has a special name, which we call newtons, right? So that's why I just wrote it as 15 newtons. Sometimes it's good to do that when you're first learning it to make sure that your units are, are working out correctly. So that would be the resultant force acting on the object, right? 15 newtons, in this case, um, it's we're, we drew it as acting to the right. Okay, part B. If the same force is applied to an object with a mass of four kilograms, what is, its, what is its acceleration? So this is really the same situation here, but now this net force is acting on an object. So we have the same coordinate system here, um, which has a mass of four kilograms. And we want to know the acceleration. Okay, so again, if I just look at what's going on in the x direction, I have some of the forces in the x equals max. Since I'm solving for acceleration, I can divide by m. So that means the acceleration in the x direction is gonna be the sum of the forces in the x direction divided by m. But in this case, the sum of the forces is simply gonna be the net force divided by m. So if we plug in here, the net force was what, 15 newtons divided by the mass, which we're now saying is four. Got to write the units, 4.0 kilograms. And if you work that out, you're going to get 3.75. And that has units of meters per second squared, right? It's an acceleration. So the acceleration in the x direction is 3.5 meters per second squared. If you want to write it as a vector, right, it has the same magnitude, but we drew it as now it has a direction, right, going to the right here. So that would be the actual acceleration. Okay, another example. Given two forces acting on an object of mass two kilograms, as shown below, what is the magnitude and direction of the acceleration? Well, again, so now. Now we're given vectors, right? So we know that Newton's second law says that the net force 
which is a vector, which is the sum of the forces, has to equal MA. So what I really need to do is I need to add these two forces up. I need to add these two forces together. Okay. Um, we could do this graphically right now, right? If I move the tail of F2 to the tip of F1, it'll look something like this. And then if I draw a vector from the tail of F1 to the tip of F2, it'll be like that, right? So that is really like my net force. It'll be that green um, vector there. And then once I have that value, which we can do by adding th these two vectors um, analytically, then I know that the acceleration is gonna be in the same direction as that net force, right? Because Newton's second law says the net force equals MA, right? The sum of the forces and net force equals MA. And the direction of the acceleration is given by the direction of the net force or vice versa, direction of net force is given by the direction of the acceleration. Because mass here is just a scalar. The direction appears in the acceleration and the net force. So the acceleration has to have the same direction as that net force. But we can, when we find, when we solve this net force, right, we can put it in polar form where we have the magnitude and direction. And then that direction is gonna be the same as the direction of the acceleration. Okay, so this goes back a little bit to adding vectors, right? We have to add these two vectors together. So we need to find the components, right? Let me start with F1. Well, that's easy because it's acting right along the x-axis, right? This is F1. Its magnitude what, is 100 newtons, I guess, and the direction is zero degrees. So we know that F1x is going to be 100, right? The x component, positive 100, and then F1y is going to be zero. So if you want, you can write F1 as 100 i hat plus zero j hat newtons. Okay, what about F2? So F2 is going to be 75 newtons. So let me draw at 30 degrees, right? So this is F2. The magnitude of F2 is 75 newtons. And then this angle here is 30 degrees. So I need to find the components, right? I need to find the X component, F2X, and then the Y component, F2Y. It's a little bit more work than I had to do for F1. Okay, so how do I find the components? Well, remember, I can extract this right triangle. This is a good review, right, of vectors. This is 30 degrees. The hypotenuse is the magnitude of that vector. And I want to find F2X, F2Y. Since F2X is adjacent to the angle, then I use cosine, right? So F2X is going to be 75 times cosine of 30. And in this case, it's positive, right? Because it's pointing to the right. So that's going to be 64.95. Um, Newtons. And then F2Y is going to be 75 times sine of 30. It's also positive because it's acting upward. And that's going to be sine of 30 is a half, right? So 75 divided by 2 is 37.5 newtons. So um, F2, I can write as... 64.95 Newton or I, I hat plus 37.5 J hat, right? Newtons. Okay, so let me come back over here. I want to find F net, right? Which is the sum of the forces. Well, that means I have to add F1 plus F2. But F1 was 100 I hat plus zero J hat. And then F2 was 64.95 I hat 
plus 37.5 J hat. So if I add those together, um, remember I wanna add the I hats together, right? The X components, which is the I hats. So I'm going to get like 164.95 I hat plus, and then add the J hats together, the Y components together. You could remember you could also do this in a table if you'd like, and that's going to be thirty-seven point five J hat. So that is my net force. Now, what quadrant is it in? Well, since both are positive, it's the first quadrant. We already knew that because remember we drew a picture. We kind of estimated it. It's that green arrow right there. So if I draw this out. I know the X component is. So this is like F net X is 164.95. And this would be like F net Y, which is 37.5 Newtons. So the actual vector must be this vector right in the first quadrant. If it has those two components, it must be this vector. That's F net. And we want to find the magnitude, like the length of the hypotenuse, and the direction. Call it phi. Well, again, we know how to do all this. We've done so many problems with, with vectors, right? We're just writing, basically, we're writing the vector which we have in um, component form right here. We're going to write it in polar form, right? We're going to give a magnitude and direction. So remember, how do you find the magnitude? Well, it's going to be using Pythagorean theorem. So it'll be the square root of the x component squared plus the y component squared. And that ends up being like 169.2 Newtons. And then to find the direction, I know tan of phi is gonna be opposite over adjacent. So that means phi is gonna be the inverse tan of 37.5 over 164.95. Again, what I'm you what I'm doing is I'm extracting the right triangle that contains the reference angle to do this. Right? I'm looking for the hypotenuse. That's F net. I know the adjacent side, which is the X component, 164.95. And I know the opposite, which is 37.5. So tangent of phi is opposite divided by adjacent. So that means phi itself is gonna be the inverse tan of opposite over adjacent. Okay, and if you work this out, you're gonna get 12.8 degrees. Um, because we're in the first quadrant, I could just leave it as 12.8, but just to be more clear, I'll just write as north of east. Right, just to make sure that you know I'm in the in the first quadrant. Okay, but what did we want to solve in this problem? Remember, we were looking for. Let me go back to the problem itself. So, given those two forces acting on the object, what is the magnitude and direction of the acceleration? Well, the direction of the acceleration we have now because it's the same as the direction of the net force, and I know that the direction of that net force is 12.8 degrees north of east. To get the magnitude, I can simply use Newton's second law. So I'll do that here, right? We know that F net equals MA. So that means A is going to be F net divided by M. So in this case, the net force was the, the magnitude right of that net force, the hypotenuse basically there, 169.2, divided by the mass, which was, I believe, two kilograms, right? Two. So then that's going to be um, 84.6 meters per second squared. And then the direction is going to be the same as the direction of the net force. Okay, so actually, if I want to write this in vector form, I could say a vector 
is equal to 84.6 meters per second squared at 12.8 degrees north of east. Okay, so that gives the vector, the acceleration in um, polar form. It has a magnitude, 84.6 meters per second squared, and it has a direction, which is the same as the direction of the net force. Okay, next, next example. You're told a football punter accelerates a football from rest um, to a speed of 10 meters per second during the time in which his foot is in contact with the ball, which is about 0.2 seconds, so very short time. If the football has a mass of 0 0.50 kilograms, what average force does the punter exert on the ball? Okay, well, so here, let me let me draw a little picture here. So I have, um, I have the football, right? There's gonna be some force acting on it, say in that direction. There's going to be an acceleration in the same direction. These are really vectors. And we want to figure out the average force acting on the ball. So what we need to do first is we need to figure out the acceleration of the ball. And we can think of it as being constant, OK? For this problem, we can think of it as being a constant acceleration. Now, how do we figure out the acceleration? Because once we have the acceleration, we could just apply Newton's second law, right? So this is sort of, this is the net force. So I know that the net force is equal to mass times acceleration. And again, to make it easy, I, I'll just think of that as being the x direction. So we're really just figuring out the net force in the x direction equals max. Okay, but how do I figure out AX? How do I figure out the acceleration in the X direction? Here's where we have to go back to our kinematics, right? Because we're given some information here. We know that the initial, this is starting from rest, right? So we know the initial velocity of that football is zero. So V naught X is zero. We know the final velocity, VX is 10. Right after the foot loses contact, it has 10, a velocity of 10 meters a second. We know the time that the object is accelerating for that 0.2 seconds. And we're looking for the acceleration, right? That's unknown. That's what we're trying to find. However, if you go back to your kinematic equations, you recognize that we have an equation that involves all those variables. So Vx equals V naught x plus Ax delta t. Um, this term is just zero, and then I can solve that for AX. Right? If I divide both sides by delta T, it's going to be VX divided by delta T. So this is going to be, if I plug in, this is 10, and this is 0.2. So it's going to be 50 meters per second squared. So that's my square here. So 50... 0 0.0 meters per second squared. That's my acceleration in the x direction. So now how do I find the net force acting on it? So now I can use this equation, right? This equation right here. So the net force acting on it in the x direction must be the mass times acceleration. So literally I'm just multiplying mass times acceleration now. So net force in the x direction is mass times acceleration in the x direction. The mass we knew was 0.5 right, kilograms, and the acceleration is 50. So that's going to be 25 newtons. So the foot must, assuming that it's, you know, constant acceleration, and then this force is like a constant force. But you can say average force, but you can think of it as a constant force acting over that time period. Then the force that the foot exerted on the ball is... 25 newtons. Okay, so that's our answer, 25 newtons. All right, another example. You're told a 0.1 kilogram hockey puck is hit on a frozen lake um, and is initially moving at 15 meters per second, right? So 
the puck is hit. It has this initial velocity of 15 meters per second. And then due to friction between the puck and the ice, the object starts to slow down, right? So five seconds later, its speed is six meters per second. We want to figure out what the acceleration of the puck is, right? And we're, we'll assume that we have constant acceleration again. So this again will involve kinematics. And then once we have that information, we want to figure out ultimately what the coefficient of kinetic friction is between the puck and the ice. Okay, so I'm gonna draw, I'm gonna draw a picture. Here is the puck. What are the forces acting on it? Well, it has a weight for sure. So there's a gravitational force, right? The force that the earth exerts on the puck. There's a normal force, the force that the ice exerts on the puck perpendicular to the surface. I'll just call that N for normal force. And there's also, like, so this puck is moving to the right. There's also a frictional force that's acting, that's resisting the motion acting to the left. And since it's moving, this is called a kinetic frictional force, right? So we have FK acting to the left. All right, so basically that's our free body diagram. We have the weight, which is the gravitational force. We have the normal force. We have the frictional force. Okay, the first thing we wanna figure out is the acceleration of this object. Well, this object, right, initially it's moving, we'll assume it's moving to the right at 15, meters per second. So this is like our V naught X. And then later it's moving to the right, but only at six meters per second. So this is like VX, right? This is our final velocity is six meters per second. And we know it's undergoing an acceleration, which must be to the left now. And we got to figure out that acceleration call AX. Okay, so here's where we have to use kinematics, right? So I know V naught X is 15. I know V final X is six. I know, what else do I know? I know the time, right? I know the time Delta T was five seconds and I'm looking for AX. So again, it looks like we can use this first equation VX is V naught X plus AX Delta T. Let me solve this for AX, so I'll subtract V naught X from both sides. So VX minus V naught X equals AX Delta T, and I'll divide by Delta T. So that cancels, so AX is gonna be VX minus V naught X divided by Delta T. So if I plug in here, this is gonna be six minus 15 divided by five. And if you worked it out, it turns out it's negative, which is good, it should be negative 1.8 meters per second squared. That's a two there, second squared, okay. So negative 1.8 meters second squared, that is our acceleration, right? So we have, we have our answers to part A. Now part B is asking, what is the coefficient of kinetic friction between the puck and the ice? So for part B, we wanna find out what mu k is. Okay, and we don't have, we don't know that yet, right? There's no, um, it's not given, right? So we wanna calculate it. But we do know that the kinetic frictional force has this nice, model here, you can model it with this nice equation where FK is simply equal to mu K times N. So it looks like if I divide both sides by N, it looks like if I solve for FK, so mu K now is gonna be FK divided by N. So if I figure out what FK is and I figure out what N is, normal force, then I can find mu K. So I need to know these two things. I need to know FK, I need to know N. So how do I do that? This is gonna involve Newton's second law. All right, so I'm gonna apply Newton's second law in the x direction and the y direction. I'm gonna do the y direction first. 
So let me let me write this here. So apply. Newton's second law in x and y directions. OK, I'm going to do the y direction first. So that says that the sum of the forces in the y direction must equal m-a-y. Now, what are all the forces acting on the object? Well, remember I drew a free by diagram here. I, first of all, I want to make sure I have a coordinate system. Well, in this case, since I know it's moving to the right, I'm going to call that the positive x direction. And then perpendicular to that will be the positive y direction. Right? So straight up would be positive y direction. So if I want all of the forces acting in the y direction, another way of saying that is I want the y components of all the forces. I want the y component of the normal force. I want the y component of the weight. I want the y component of the kinetic frictional force, and that's got to equal m a y, right? I'm summing all the forces in the y, so I want the y components of each of the forces. Now, if you look at this, the normal force is acting straight up, right? So how much of that vector, these are really vectors. Here, I'll emphasize that there are vectors here. How much of that normal force vector is acting in the y direction? All of it, and it's positive. So the y component of the normal force is all of n, right? It's plus n. It's the entire normal force, right? It's acting in the y direction, it's positive. Now, what about the y component of the weight? Well, how much of the weight is acting in the y direction? All of it, but negative. So in this case, this will be negative, and then the weight we can write as mg. And then what about the frictional force? So that's a vector pointing to the left. So how much of that vector is in the y direction? None of it, right? It's all in the negative x direction. It's none in the y. So this component here is going to be zero. And then what is the acceleration in the y direction? Well, here's where the constraint comes in. This puck is just simply moving on the ice on a flat surface. It's not moving in the y direction at all. So that means the acceleration here is zero, which means this whole thing is going to be zero, right? M time, anything times zero is going to give you zero. So what this equation tells us, if I if I add mg to both sides, is that the normal force is simply equal to the weight. That's what this equation tells me. The normal force is equal to the weight of that hockey puck. Okay, and actually we can solve for it because I know the mass of the puck is 0.1. And g, of course, is 9.8. So if you solve for that, you're going to find this is 0.98 newtons. So that's our normal force, 0.98 newtons. Now let's do the x direction, some of the forces in the x direction. Acting on that puck. So again, when you're first learning this, I would write everything out. So I want the x component of the normal force plus the x component of the weight plus the x component of the kinetic frictional force. That's going to equal max. Even though some of these terms might be zero and you can kind of skip this later, but for now I would just write everything out. So what is the x component of the normal force? Well, how much of that normal force is acting in the x direction? None of it, right? It's all acting in the positive y. Same thing with the weight. How much of the weight is acting in the x direction? None of it. But then when we get to the frictional force, how much of the frictional force is acting in the x direction? All of it, and it's acting negative, right? It's going to be negative value here. So this the nx is going to be 0, right? None of that normal force is acting in the x direction. None of the weight is acting in the x direction, but the x component of the frictional force is going to be minus the total frictional force, so minus Fk, and that's going to equal Max. Okay, so now, um, if I want, I can solve this for Fk. Remember, our goal is to figure out mu k, right? And mu k. Um, we could we could solve mu k if we can figure out fk and we can figure out n. We found n already. We know that value down here, 0 0.98 newtons. So now we just have to figure out fk. Well, we can solve for fk here if I divide both sides by negative 1. So basically, this is going to be negative max. And I know that the mass was 0.1. And I know that the acceleration, which I found earlier, was negative 
right? We found that up here. So that was negative 1.8 meters second square. So now if I work that out, of course, I'm going to get, it's just going to be a magnitude, a negative, negative, positive. That's great. That's, that's the way it should be. So it's going to be 0.18 newtons. And now finally, I can solve for mu k, which is what I really want, that coefficient, right? It's going to be fk divided by the normal force. So it'll be 0.18 divided by, and the normal force is 0.98. And that turns out to be around 0.18, I guess, in this case again. So 0.18. And remember, there's no units for the coefficient kinetic friction. It's unitless. So this is this is unitless. It's just a number. How do we know that? Because if you look at the units here, right, this is the um, kinetic frictional force. This is in newtons. And the normal forces and newtons, and those are going to cancel, right? You just get a number that doesn't have any units. So that's our answer. Mu k is 0.18. Okay, another problem. Um, and we're going to do something like this in lab as well. So this one says an object with mass m1 equals five kilograms rest on a friction. So this case, this mass right here is five kilograms. It's on a frictionless surface, right? Flat frictionless surface. And it's connected to a cable or a string that goes over a pulley, which is connected to a second mass, M2 here, right? Hanging mass or suspended mass, which has a mass of 10 kilograms. So M2 is 10 kilograms. We're gonna release the system from rest and it's gonna accelerate. The M1 will accelerate to the right, and at the same time, M2 will accelerate downward. And what we want to figure out is that acceleration. We want to calculate that acceleration. Okay. Well, in this case, I have two objects. I want to break this up. I'm going to look at each object separately. So I'm going to start with M1. Let me draw a free body diagram for M1. Well, what forces do I have acting on it? I have the gravitational force, right, which is the weight, I'll call that weight one, which is M1g. It, again, it's really a vector. I have the normal force, right, that surface is exerting a force upward on M1, perpendicular to the surface, so I have a normal force acting up. I don't have any friction here, right, because we're saying it's frictionless, so normally, normally I would have a frictional force acting in this direction, backwards, but I don't since there's no friction here, but I do have this string or this cable connected to the M1. So I have a tension in the string or cable that's pulling to the right. So I have this like tension force acting to the right. Okay, so um, let's use our standard coordinate system of X going to the right and Y going upward. Here, I'll even draw it in here. So that means X is like along this. And then y will be perpendicular upward. This is y. And then let me apply Newton's second law in the y direction and the x direction for this mass one. So I'll do I'll do the y direction first, and then I'll do the x direction. Okay, normally. It's really complicated to figure out, not really complicated, but you have to do a little extra work to figure out the components of a, of a vector, right? Because let's say we have a vector um, A here. Then you'd have to, if you knew this angle theta, you'd have to project it onto the x-axis and find AX, project it onto the y-axis and find AY. Right? Or actually, let's not call it A. Let's call it, because um, that's going to remind you of acceleration. Let's call it like, I'll call it like F. Because it's really a force. So we'd have to find Fx and Fy. And how do we do that? Well, we'd have to use trig, right? So Fx would be F times cosine of theta. Fy would be F times sine of theta, right? We could find the components. In this example, we again have to find the components, but it's much easier because we chose our coordinate system so that these vectors are pointing right along the coordinate system. So we can just, we could use angles if we wanted to, but it's easier just to look at it and figure out what the components are, okay? 
So if I'm talking about just the y direction, that means I want the y component of the normal force plus the y component of the tension plus the y component of the weight. That's got to equal m1ay. But what is the y component of the normal force? If I look at this normal force vector, how much of that vector is pointing in the y direction? All of it is, right? And it's positive because it's pointing upward. So this y component of n, and y is all of n, and it's plus. So the entire normal force, whatever that magnitude is, it's all in a positive direction, okay? If you really wanted to solve it using this approach over here, where we have an angle, you could say that angle is 90 degrees, right? And then n y would be n times sine of 90. But sine of 90 is 1, and you would just get plot positive n again, OK? But since you don't have to do that, you can just look at it and figure out what the, what the component is. All right, what about ty? Well, how much of this tension, this vector, is in the y direction? None of it, right? It's, all along the positive x, but none in the y. So this is going to be 0. And then what about w1y, the weight here? How much of that weight vector is in the y direction? All of it, and it's negative. So this will be minus m1g. And then what is the acceleration in the y direction? Well, this object is not moving in the y direction, right? It's it's going to be moving in the x direction, but not in the y direction. So the acceleration in the y direction is zero. So this first equation just basically tells us again that the normal force is equal to the weight of the object. Okay, which which isn't always true, but if you have an object, it's on a flat surface and there's no other vertical forces acting, then that will be true. The normal force will equal the weight of the object. Okay, now let's look in the x direction. So in the x direction, I now have the x component of the normal force plus the x component of the tension plus the x component of the weight has to equal m1ax. Now, what is, how much of that normal force is in the, acting in the x direction? None of it. How much of the tension? All of it, so all of t. How much of the weight? None of it. And that's going to equal m1ax. So then I can write this equation as t equals m1ax. Okay, and I'll box it because that's going to be like our first important equation here. All right, what about, so that's for the for the object that's sliding, right? What about M2, this hanging object? Let's look at it. So I'm going to draw a free by diagram. So this is M2. Um, what are the forces acting on it? Well, it has a gravitational force, the weight. I'll call this W2 which is equal to m2g. And then it has a tension. And we're assuming that this is like a lightweight cable, lightweight string. So that tension should be the same tension as before. But in this case, that string is pulling up, right, on that, on that hanging object. And we know that this thing is going to accelerate downward. OK? So I want to create a coordinate system. But because it's moving downward, we're, it's going to turn out that I'm going to do this instead. I'm going to have the x pointing down because I know it's moving like in the positive x direction and the y pointing perpendicular like that. So I'm kind of rotating my coordinate system. So the x is pointing down like this. This is like the plus x direction and then y will be perpendicular to it. You don't have to do this, but it's going to turn out to be a little easier if you do it this way. So now we're going to apply Newton's second law. Let me do the, the y direction first. That's the easier one. So some of the forces in the y equals m2 now, a y. So I have the y component of the tension plus the y component of the weight equals m2 a y. Well, remember, in this case, the y direction is horizontal, right? So how much of these vectors are in the y direction, the way we define it, y being to the right here, none of those vectors are in the y direction, right? So basically, this is like saying 0 plus 0 is equal to, and it's not accelerating in the y direction, so that's also 0. So this is saying 0 equals 0, right? which is true, but not very helpful. So now let me go to the x direction. So some of the forces in the x equals m2 ax. Now I want the x component of the tension plus the x component of weight 2, that's got to equal m2ax. 
So how much of that tension is acting in the X direction? How much of that vector is in the X direction? Well, all of it is, and it's actually negative, right? Because remember, I've defined positive X to be downward. So the X component of the tension is going to be minus all of T. And then what about the weight? How much of the weight is acting in the X direction? All of it is, and it's positive because it's acting downward. So this is going to be plus M2G. And that's got to equal M2AX. I'm just going to call it A since I call it A. I'm, same thing over here. Let me just call this A. So T equals M1A. And in this equation, our second equation here is going to be minus T plus M2G is equal to M2A. OK. Now, ultimately, what I want to do is I want to find the acceleration right, of this system. I know the masses. And now I have two equations with two unknowns. I don't know the tension t, and I don't know a. right? I don't know the acceleration. Everything else, I know g, 9.8. I know m2, and I know m1. I know the masses. But from algebra, right, we know how to solve this for a. Because this is like a, a system of two linear equations and two unknowns. And I can I know how to solve that. I can either use substitution, I could use elimination. So I'm gonna solve for A using substitution. So I'll do that here. I'll solve for A. Solve for the acceleration using substitution. So what does that mean? It means I'm going to plug in, I'm going to take this T and go over to this equation where I have T, I'm going to plug in M1A, right? So this becomes minus, so T now is M1A plus M2G is equal to M2A. Now to solve this for A, let me bring the A's onto one side. So I'll add M1A to both sides. So I'm gonna have, I'm gonna write the left-hand side, uh, the right-hand side and the left-hand side. So I'll write this as M1A plus M2A is equal to, and then I just have M2G right on the other side. And then finally to get A, I can factor it out. See how it's common to both terms here? I can factor it out front. I'm left with M1 plus M2 is equal to M2G. And then finally, if I divide by M1 plus M2, then I have what I want, I have A. So it looks like the acceleration here is gonna be M2G divided by M1 plus M2. Okay, so, so that will be the acceleration. I'll write it here again, so I have it's going to be M2G divided by M1 plus M2. So now I can plug in, right? I know M2 is 10. I know G is 9.8. M1 was what, 5 plus 10, plus M2, which is 10, right? And if you work this out, this is going to be 6.53 meters per second squared. So that's our acceleration of that system of those two objects, right? The, <clears throat> this thing, this M1 here will be accelerating at 6.53 meters per second squared to the right. And then the hanging object, the hanging mass here will be accelerating downward at the same rate of 6.53 meters per second squared. Now, what about the tension in the cable, right? So remember there's this, tension in the cable, and we're assuming it's the same throughout the cable. How do we figure out the tension? Well, now that we have A, remember we derived this formula right here, which involves T, the tension, and A, the acceleration. Now that we have A, we could just plug into this formula. Or if you wanted to, you could even plug into this one. But this one's the easier one, right? So if we go back to that second page now, I'm simply going to use the fact that I know that T equals M1 times A. So M1 is 5, and then A was 
and we'll find that that tension is 32.65 newtons. Okay. This one, this problem is a little bit more challenging because it had two, it was like a system of two objects that were moving and you had to isolate each system separately. Okay. But same process, right? We drew the free by diagram for each object. We applied Newton's second law, and then eventually we could solve for the unknown variables. Again, we'll do a lot more with this particular example in lab with this system of, of these two objects. Okay, a couple more examples here. In this one, you're told J is gliding north on his cross-country skis across a flat section of snow at seven meters per second. Okay, it's moving at seven meters per second. His mass is 100 kilograms. You're also told that the coefficient of kinetic friction between the skis and the snow is 0 0.10. The coefficient of static friction is 0 0.12. You're also told that the force of air resistance, so acting against him backwards or south, is 1.9 newtons. If friction and air resistance are the only horizontal forces acting on J, what is his horizontal acceleration? So ultimately, we're trying to find um, AX, right? The horizontal acceleration. So let me let me let me draw this picture first. So here is here's J. Actually, get some skis, right? Some skis. What are the forces acting on on J? Well his weight, which really acts at his center of mass, which is kind of around his belly button somewhere, like draw it like right there. So we have the weight of J acting down. So that's MG. There's a force that the snow, the surface exerts on the skis, right? Up, that's the normal force. So there's a normal force exerted up. And then we have um, a kinetic frictional force acting to the left, and then a wind force, like a resistance force, I'll just call it R. So R is like the wind force acting to the left as well, right? It's opposing his motion. J is moving to the right, we're gonna assume, and these forces are acting, the forces opposing his motion are acting to the left. And let's just create easy coordinate system. I'll just call X to be positive to the right and Y to be positive upward. Okay, so let me apply Newton's um, Newton's laws, and I'll start with the y direction. So I have some of the forces in the y equals m a y. So I want the y component of the normal force plus the y component of the weight plus the y component of the kinetic frictional force plus the y component of the wind force. That's going to equal m a y. But again, I don't even need any trig in this example because these vectors are right along the axes. So it's easy to figure out, right? What's the y component of the normal force? Well, it's acting straight up. So it's going to be all of n and it's positive. What's the y component of the weight? Well, the weight is acting down. So it's negative, but it's the entire weight is acting around the negative in the negative x direction, right? So it's going to be minus mg. So for wy, it's minus mg. And then the other two forces, the frictional force, the kinetic friction and the air resistance are acting in the negative x direction. There's no component in the y direction. So these are both zero. And then since J is not moving off the surface of the snow, he's not moving in the y direction at all, the acceleration in the y direction is zero. So again, this just tells us that the normal force is equal to the weight, right? So the normal force is equal to J's weight in this case. So N equals MG. And then if we want, we can, um, we can calculate this. J's mass was what, 100? G, of course, is 9.8. So this is going to be 980 newtons. So normal force is 980 newtons. Um, we could also calculate the magnitude of the kinetic frictional force now, too, because remember, we know that Fk is mu k times n. And mu k we were given as 0.12. And the normal force we now know is 980. So this tells us that the magnitude of that kinetic frictional force is 98.0 newtons. Okay. 
Okay. Let's now turn to the x direction. So now I have some of the forces in the x equals max. So now I want the x component of the normal force plus the x component of the weight plus the x component of the kinetic frictional force plus the x component of the air resistance. That's got to equal max. Well, how much of that normal force vector is in the x direction? None of it. How much of the weight is in the x direction? None of it. What about the kinetic frictional force? Actually, all of it is in the x direction. And since it's resistant motion, it's negative, right? It's in the negative x direction. So here, I'll write this as negative all of FK. And then how much of that um, air resistance is in the x direction? All of it, and again, it's negative. So negative R, that's got to equal MAX. And notice that what we were trying to find was this acceleration, right, AX. So I can solve this for AX. In fact, I can just divide both sides by M and you're gonna find AX is equal to minus FK minus R divided by M. And if we plug in, remember the magnitude of FK is 98. The magnitude of the air resistance was, I forget, 1.9, I think. Yeah, 1.9. And then the mass was, J's mass was 100. And if you work this out, this is going to be like negative 0.99. I'll just call it negative 1. Negative 1 meters per second squared. And it has a direction. What's the direction? Acting backwards. Acting south, I guess, in this case. right? We call, I'll just say backwards acting in the negative x direction, right? That's what the negative tells us. So the acceleration is going to be in that direction. And that makes sense, right? Because the basically the air resistance and the kinetic frictional force are slowing J down, right? So they're acting in the negative x direction, right? So that's our answer. So negative one meters per second squared is the answer um, for the acceleration. Now, notice here that we didn't even have to use all the information. They kind of gave us this, they said initially, um, J is moving at seven meters a second. That's great, but we didn't need to know that, right? And also they gave us the um, coefficient of, what else did they give us here? Oh, I guess we needed everything else, right? That's the only thing we didn't need. We didn't need to know that. So sometimes you're given information that you don't actually need. You just have to be careful with that. Sometimes you're given extra information. All right, one more example. So in this example, you're told Scott is rolling down a 30 degree a slope on his skateboard. The total mass of Scott in the skateboard is 75 kilograms. The rolling friction, so rolling friction we haven't really learned about yet. We talked about static friction and kinetic friction. You can think of rolling friction as somewhat like kinetic friction okay just accept it as like it's just going to resist motion we're not going to get too much into rolling friction but think of it as just like a force that's resisting the motion right so it's kind of like kinetic frictional force so the rolling friction between the skateboard wheels and the concrete is nine newtons acting backwards against the skateboard and you're also told that there's a drag force due to air resistance of 11 newtons acting backwards against um against scott what is scott's acceleration so we want to figure out Scott's acceleration. Okay, so let's draw a picture here. So we have this slope. We know the slope is 30 degrees. And um, we have Scott here on the skateboard. I can't draw it all, so I'm just going to draw a stick diagram. And there's the skateboard, right? And there's several forces acting. Actually, Scott has a weight, right? That's always acting, the gravitational force. But remember, how does that act? That acts straight down towards the center of the Earth. So that's going to be like this. So weight equals mg. Then we have the normal force that the surface, the road or whatever, exerts on Scott acting perpendicular to the surface. So that's up like that. So nine degrees to the surface. And then finally, we have a rolling frictional force acting 
up the ramp. So I'll call this FR for like rolling friction. And then there's an air resistance and the way that they word the problem, I guess it's acting up the ramp as well. So we'll call, just call that R for air resistance. Okay, so probably what I wanna do in this case is I wanna have a coordinate system where um, it's set up so that X is like just down the ramp. It's parallel to the ramp. It'll make more sense that way. And then Y is perpendicular to the ramp. Then the only force that's gonna actually have a component that can, it's gonna have components that, or I should say the only force vector that's not in one of these directions, X and Y is the weight and we'll have to find its components. So X is like going down the ramp like that. And then Y is going to be perpendicular to the ramp like this. Okay, here, I'll, I'll draw it again where I, I rotate the coordinate system. And see if you guys can see this here. So this is Y now, this is X. So I have the normal force is in the positive y direction, right? Then I have the rolling frictional force is a negative x. And then right on top of it is the air resistance is negative x. And now the weight is gonna act at an angle like this. Remember that's mg. It may not be obvious if you think about this for a bit though, this angle here, 30 degrees, that the ramp makes with the horizontal is the same as this angle right here. This turns out to be 30 degrees. So that means in this case, this is gonna be 30 degrees, which means if you want, you could say this is 60, right? 90 minus 30 is 60 degrees. So we need to find the X component of the weight that's like WX and then the Y component of the weight. This would be WY. So we can do that first. Um, it depends on how you want to do this. I usually like to extract the right triangle that includes the reference angle because then um, the X component will always involve the cosine and the Y component will always involve the sine, which matches up with what we've been doing. But some people, because we're given the angle of 30 degrees, they like to use this triangle. But if you do that, then the X component is going to be opposite the angle, which means it's going to involve sine. And usually X involves cosine. So it's up to you, right? Wait, I'll, here, I'll do it both ways. So I can either use this triangle that involves the reference angle, which is 60 degrees here. And then this is gonna be the way mg, right? This is gonna be wx, this will be wy. Or I could use this triangle Let me draw that better. where this is 30 degrees, this is mg, and then this is wx, and this is wy. Either way, but in this, in this left case, since wx is adjacent to the 60 degrees, that just involves cosine, so it'd be wx equals mg times cosine of 60, and then wy is mg times sine of 60 because wy is opposite, right? Remember cosine of 60 is adjacent over hypotenuse, which means the adjacent side is gonna be the hypotenuse times cosine of 60, mg times cosine of 60. And then sine of 60 is opposite wy over hypotenuse, which means that wy is gonna be mg times sine of 60. But if you use the other triangle, then it reverses, right? So now if I want the X component, that's opposite 30 degrees. So this would be WX here would be MG times sine of 30. And then WY, since it's adjacent, would be MG times cosine of 30. But it doesn't matter because you're gonna get the same answer. Why? Because cosine of 60 is the same as sine of 30. And sine of 60 is the same as cosine of 30.
So it doesn't matter which way you do it, you're going to get the same answer. You just kind of want to choose one way of doing it and sticking with it. And to me, the easiest way to do it is to just use always the reference angle, 60 degrees here, which we had to calculate, right? We had to do 90 minus 30 to get to 60. But then if you use a reference angle, then the X component always involves cosine and the Y component always involves sine. So it just may be easier that way. So anyways, if you work this out, so this is gonna be M, which is 75 times G 9.8 times cosine of 60 or sine of 30, either way, you're gonna get 367.5 Newtons. And in WY, it's 75 times 9.8 times sine of 60. And that's going to be, um, and it's negative, right? Because WY is acting downward, is negative 636.5 Newtons. Okay, so now, We want to figure out the acceleration in the x direction. So now let me apply Newton's second law in the x direction. Actually, let me do both. Let me do the y and x. We, we may not even need the y in this case, but let me do both. So let me do some of the forces in the y. I'll do y first is equal to m a y. So now I want the y component of the normal force plus the y component of the weight plus the y component of the rolling frictional force plus the y component of the air resistance is equal to MAY. So because all of that normal force vector is in the positive y direction, then the y component of N is gonna be just N. The y component of the weight here is basically wy, which in its negative, right? It's acting downward. So this is minus mg, which is calculated it, minus mg um, sine of 60. And then the y components of the other two forces, the air resistance and the rolling friction are both zero, right? Th those vectors are in a negative x direction. There's no component in the y direction. So these are both zero. And then since this skateboard is not leaving the road, it's not moving in the y direction at all, we have a constraint that the acceleration in the y direction is zero. So in this case, the normal force is not quite equal to the weight, it's equal to mg times sine of 60. Right? It's equal to the y component of the weight, basically. But we don't, but you wouldn't need, so if you weren't given the frictional force and you're given just a mu, like a mu r, in this case, a mu for rolling friction, then you would need the normal force to calculate the frictional force. But we were given the frictional force directly, so we don't really need this, all right? But I wanted to, to do it anyways, because usually you have to do both the x direction and the y direction. You have to apply Newton's second law in both directions. All right, let's do the x direction now. So now I have some of the forces in the x is equal to max. So now I have the x component of the normal force plus the x component of the weight plus the x component of the rolling friction. So this should be just R, x, plus the x component of the drag force is equal to M, A, x. Okay, how much of that normal force is in the x direction? None. How much of the weight is? Well, part of it is now, right? Um, in fact, it's positive. We can see that here, and we calculated it down here. Remember Wx was mg times cosine of 60. So I'll just write it out like that for now. So I'll, plus it's mg cosine of 60. And then what about the x component of the rolling frictional force? Well, the entire vector is in the x direction and it's in the negative x direction. So I'm gonna write that as negative the entire rolling frictional force. And then same thing with the air resistance, the entire thing is in the X direction, so it's negative the entire air resistance force. And that's gotta equal MAX. Okay, we can solve this for AX by dividing both sides by M. So I'm gonna get AX is equal to 
mg cosine of 60, which I already computed, minus fr minus r over m. Or if you want, you could write this as it's the x component of the weight, which I already computed, minus fr minus r over m. All right, so let's plug in. So the x component of the weight was what? 367.5 minus the rolling frictional force was nine minus the air resistance was 11 divided by the person's mass with the skateboard was 75. That's AX. And it turns out that equals um, positive 4.63 meters per second squared. What is the direction of this acceleration? Well, it's along the x direction, which is like down the slope, right? Since it's positive, we know it's it's going down the slope. So we can say down the slope. So that would be the acceleration of the person on the skateboard. All right, as with anything, we're gonna get a lot more practice. So there'll, there'll be in-class practice and a project for you guys to work on as well with Newton's, Newton's laws. Great, thanks.